Okay, hi everyone. So today we're going to be starting the first of our videos on selections or selection statements or if statements as part of ECS 1021. All right, so we're going to start off with an introduction and then we'll move on to other topics like the if semantics, uh, different uh, versions of statements, one versus multiple scopes of variables, etc. All right. It's important to point out that there are references that you can go to, uh, for instance, the Java 8 Fundamentals book. Uh, we've got uh, two links to it, either through tinyurl or bit.ly, and specifically in chapter 4 we're looking at Boolean logical operators, or in chapter 5 we're looking at the section on if statements. If you want to see an example of the scanner class which we use in this uh, these slides, you can take a look at the Geeks for Geeks website right here, and again there's two links right here to get you some examples and some further explanation about how scanner works. All right, so we're going to be talking about if statements or selection statements today, and it's often a really good idea to represent them using flowcharts. And a flowchart starts generally at the top, ends down at the bottom, and the progress is denoted by arrows. And you can see this, this line with an arrow in it, and it goes, it leads to a diamond. And that diamond right there has or contains basically a question we often refer to these questions as Boolean expressions. But basically what it is, it's a question that you ask or the program asks and it has one of two answers. The answer can either be true or it can be false. If the answer to the question inside of this diamond right here is true, then it leads to a branch of the program that has one or perhaps more statements that have to be executed. In this particular case, we have statement 1.1, and then afterwards, statement 1.2. And once that's done, it leads off to the end of the if statement and gets to the bottom right here. Now, that's only if the answer to that first question was true. If the answer to that question was false, then we go to perhaps another question. At least in the flowchart right here, that's what it shows, that there is another question that comes only in the event that the answer to the first question was false. Then we ask the question here. Okay, often it's good to have just a question mark inside of these diamonds. All right, so we ask this question. If the answer is true, then we go to, to statement 2.1, and then if there's a statement, another statement that leads after it, do, uh, we do 2.2, statement 2.2, and then we follow the same path that we did earlier to the end. But that was only if <clears throat> the answer to that was true. If the answer to that second question was false, then we move on to the next set of questions, etc., etc., so on and so forth. All right. When might we encounter a scenario in which this would be useful? Well, here's an example right here. We ask the user to enter a value that can be used in a calculation. Say we were calculating the area of a circle. So we ask the user, enter the radius of a circle. All right, the user enters 3 as the radius for a particular circle. Then the program responds with the circle with the radius 3.0 has an area of 28.26. So there's a calculation that goes on and there's a, a response to the user. Well, what happens if that value that the user entered was a weird or wrong value? What if it was the letter A or negative 3? the calculation would have to take that into account or we would have to take that into account before the calculation occurred in order not to get an incorrect or invalid calculation. So here's, here's a little bit more detail in terms of an example where we sort of lead to why we use selection or if statements. So this is a, a typical kind of Java program that we begin with in, in the Java program, the, the Java source file an import statement. And that import statement right here asks for the import of a, like a library that does scanning. Okay, and we're talking about scanning the keyboard. We're talking about scanning inputs from the users. Okay, so that's, the, these are methods and objects that are being brought in in order to allow that to happen. The Java file is called computeArea.java and the class that we're dealing with right here, we're going to declare it right here. It'll be a public class and we're going to call this class compute area. Inside of compute area, so denoted by this curly brace right here, inside of it, we have a main method. It's 
uh, public static void main. Here's the main method right here. And the main method has possible inputs um, from the command line using the string uh, type and arguments variable right there. But we're not going to use those. But that's just generally how it's done. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to declare an object. The object is going to be called input of type scanner. And we're going to initialize it using a predefined uh, object within the, the scanner class called system.in. Now, from there, what we do is, so we've now got this, this uh, object right here called input, and we're going to use it. We're then going to also um, have a constant that we're going to use called pi, and it's going to be a double floating point type, and it's going to be a constant, so we say final right here, and it's going to have a value of 3.14. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to ask the user to enter the radius of a circle using system.out.println. We're then going to wait for the user to input a number. And that number will be dealt with using the input object. And inside of the input object, we're going to call next double, which is a double floating point um, uh, method that will take the number and bring it in and put it in a condition that is useful or available or valid for a, a variable that we're now declaring right here of type double called radius from user. Next, we're going to create a variable called area of type double floating point, And we're going to take the radius from user and we're going to multiply it by itself. So we're going to square it and then multiplied by pi. So we're basically taking r squared multiplied by pi. That's what we're doing right here. And we're going to make this, we're going to put it into area. That's what we're doing. Then we're going to print out circle with radius, and then we're going to concatenate radius from user, which was, um, which came about from using the input object. And then we're going to finish that line with has an area of, and we're going to concatenate the, or add to uh, that, that line, the area that was calculated. All right, so that's, that's a program, a typical program that we would write in Java. So when we're, uh, when, when we're doing this, the Java class is run as a Java application, and then line four is going to be executed first, then line five, etc. Okay, all the way to line 10. Now, at line seven, right here, this is when we can get into trouble because the user could do anything that he or she wants to do. Uh, she could uh, add in the letter A, she, uh, he could put in the number th uh, negative three, we don't know. And so uh, we want to be able to test, or we should test, for um, invalid conditions from the user. So if the user enters a positive result, a positive radius, then we should be able to calculate as as we intend. But if the user enters a negative radius value, for instance, we need to be able to deal with that. So the area in this particular case shouldn't have been calculated. So we need to have a mechanism for um, dealing with selective actions. These act differently in response to valid or invalid input values. So here's a, an example. Take an integer value from the user, then output a message indicating that the number is negative, zero, or positive. So one choice, two choices, or the choice, there's one option, two options, three options. So a choice, and then we can go one or two or three different directions, okay? So basically what we're doing is we're going to branch out. We can either do one, two, or three. So here's an example of running the program. We enter a number five, and then we say to the user, we confirm that the user entered a positive number. Here's another example of the program. You enter the number, so the enter the, the user enters the number, and the enter the entered number is negative five. So then we tell the user, you've entered a negative number. And so the solution to your program must accommodate all of these potential options, these, these choices that are being made in the, the options that occur as a result of that. So up to now, we've limited things to how we write programs that are executed line by line, top to bottom. But we need a mechanism to allow the program 
to check for a list of conditions and to branch. So we check here and we go one of multiple ways depending on what that check is. To solve the above problem, the one we just did, we have three possible branches. The first branch, if the user input is negative, then we execute the first branch that prints you have just entered a negative number. Next, the user input is zero and we execute the second branch that, that prints you have entered the number zero or you've entered zero. Then you have, if the user input is positive, then we execute a third branch that prints you have entered a positive number. Now, all of this leads us to the requirement to talk about something called Boolean data types. So a data type denotes a set of related runtime values. Okay, and runtime means what happens when you are executing a program as opposed to compile time, which is what happens when you are in the process of creating your program. Okay, so we need a, a data type whose value suggests either a condition that holds or does not hold. And depending on whether it holds or doesn't hold, we take selective actions. Okay, another way of talking about hold is that's true. And if it does not hold, it's false. So the Java Boolean type consists of two literal values true or false. All relational expressions have the Boolean type. Okay, and we've seen this before in the course on procedural programming using MATLAB. It's very, very similar. Java and MATLAB have very similar roots. They've taken different directions in terms of how they work, but um, fundamentally they work the same way. So all relational expressions have the Boolean type. Let's imagine that in this particular case, we're dealing with a variable called r, and it's been assigned a value of five, okay? So we have math symbols that you've seen in many different math classes. The Java operators for them are very similar. Uh, instead of stacking, if you have less than or equal to or greater than or equal to, where you have you know, this symbol on top of that symbol or that symbol on top of that symbol, we have to put them side by side. So we can do it like this or like that. And then if we want to test for equality, we have to put two equal signs side by side, okay? So if we want to say that, um, uh, let's say uh, R is less than or equal to five or R is greater than or equal to five, or we want to know if R is um, equal to five, we can always put a question mark beside those just for our own sakes, okay? We wouldn't put that in the actual program, but, but fundamentally what these are are questions. Is R less than or equal to five? Is R greater than or equal to five? Is R equivalent to five? And in all of these cases, the outcome is a Boolean value of true. On the other hand, if we take a look at less than, greater than, or not equal to, okay, so is R less than five? Is R greater than five? Or is R not equal to five? then the answers to these questions, right, if these were questions, would be false. Now, there are many different ways to write expressions like this. If you have x is less than or equal to y, uh, x is greater than y, x is not equal to y, x is equal to y. These are questions, okay? You could write it like this. x is x greater than y not? Is x less than or equal to y not? Is x equal to y not? Or is x not equal to y not? These are equivalents. That's equivalent, that's equivalent, that's equivalent, and that's equivalent. So depending on what you want to do in your program, one or the other might be more appropriate depending on what sort of selection statement or choice you want to make or how you want to express that choice. All right, so here's some syntax for the if statement. So in Java, you would write the word if, typically we put parentheses like this and we put the Boolean expression in here. Okay, this is the inequality or the relational expression, uh, the um, something like x less than or equal to y, for instance. You put that inside of your Boolean expression right here. And, and that first expression is mandatory. Afterwards, 
what we tend to do is we put curly braces like this and we have statements inside and the statements can be either in a line like this separated by semicolons or we can have one on top of the other it doesn't really matter they're done in sequence okay so this would be done first then that would be done next afterwards all right so that's the first mandatory expression in an if or if else statement in this case, we have an optional, and it, depending on the type of, of program you have, might be required, um, else if. So if the answer to this is false, these two won't be executed, and what we'll do is move on to the else if statement right here. So then if that was false, if the outcome of this Boolean expression is false, then the next thing that will be executed will be this question right here. If and then this relational operation right in here. And then if that is true, then this statement and then that statement, any other subsequent statements within the, parent the curly braces right here will be executed. If that was false, then other branches would be expressed and, and executed, okay? On and on and so, far, so on and so forth until you get to the very end. And then if all of these were found to be false, then you would get to the default last branch. And this one simply has an else in it. And what it does is it executes only if all of these other questions that were asked, this question right here, and that question right there, and that question right there, and any others in between, it would execute the statements that are inside of the, the curly braces right here. Okay, that is the standard typical layout of an if, if else, else statement or series of statements. You would visualize it like this, okay, where this is the first if, this is the else if, so this is the if, this is the else if, the first one, then there's a bunch of other ones, then there's another else if here, that's what this is, and and then so on and so forth, okay. so. Um, this is basically what happened, and then actually this right here, that right there, is the else, okay, that's found at the very end. This is the default that, that occurs in the event that the last else if was false, and, we, and all of these other ones were false, okay? And that's it, that's the introduction to if or selection statements. Mm -hmm.